<laughs> yeah. Uh huh. Okay. Sounds good. Welcome, 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 everybody, to another episode of Fantasy News. I am your disheveled goblin host, Daniel Green, and today we're bringing back the tunics. That's right, I am demanding that we bring back the tunics. Why? Because tunics are sexy. Putting on the tunic cranks it to an 11 without a doubt. And we all know heading into 2023 that it's gonna be the sexiest year to date. So if you wanna keep up, apparently you have to buy a tunic. I really wasn't sure where I was going with this when I started it. I do think tunics look great though. Like why did they ever go away? Tunics are awesome. But getting away from attractive clothing options from the past, we're gonna go ahead and talk about the fact that the legacy of the Simon & Schuster and Penguin Random House merger has officially come to an end. As it seems that Paramount, who owns Simon & Schuster, will no longer be pursuing the sale to Penguin Random House. Now originally Bertelsmann, which is a German company which owns Penguin Random House did say it would look to appeal this decision, but that has now been rolled back. As recently as last Monday though, Paramount still seems to be in the market to get rid of Simon & Schuster, referring to it as a non-core asset because they are a video-based company. I'm sure on a business level it makes absolute sense for Paramount, which is a gargantuan company, to refer to Simon & Schuster as a non-core asset. It's just still kind of jarring to hear something valued at two billion dollars to be referred to as Non-core, like, all, all right, I'm sure you're right, but good God. But the important takeaway here is from the consumer and author angle, this is a very good thing and a great bit of news for publishing. I'm not against Paramount selling Simon & Schuster altogether, I just don't want it be to a company that already has a massive stake of control within publishing as a whole. Competition is good. I think we can all agree on that. And they managed to make Stephen King mad. Do you know what it takes to make Stephen King mad these days? Don't, don't get him involved. He's old. Let him just write his last few books. That <laughs> Moving on, let's go ahead and talk about a cover reveal. The Lost War by Justin Lee Anderson and the official Trad Publishing release. This SPFB06 place winner is officially getting that wide stamp of mega success for the indie scene adaptating into the Trad Publishing. Is that adapting? Maybe, um, yeah, I guess that applies. And I like this cover. It's not my favorite style, but I think it's a good execution of this style. I have reviewed The Lost War. You can check it out here on the channel if you want to, but this, it gets a, it's one and a half thumbs up. It's not my favorite cover ever, but you know, good job. I'm mainly just happy to see self-publishing books continue to get badass success. And shout out to Jeremy Wilson, the cover artist who did it. Oh, but what is this? Oh, it looks like we're gonna be getting a new Dresden Files short story released as a part of an upcoming anthology series featuring many other authors such as Patricia Briggs and Faith Hunter. Apparently this will follow Dresden's dog Mouse as it goes on an adventure involving Cerberus. I keep thinking I'm kinda done with Dresden Files, but then things like this happen and I'm like, all right, and I'm definitely gonna read the cute pupper story. Who's not gonna read the cute pupper story? But this will be coming to your e-readers or anthology books or however you plan on adapting it. Will it be audiobook? It doesn't say in the article, so I can't necessarily tell you. But on March 7th of 2023, that's actually pretty soon. I assume almost all of these stories will be featuring dogs or pets of some kind because they're taking the proceeds from this anthology and donating it to Lifeline Puppy Rescue. That is very wonderful and is a nice transition into some News for me. Boblin, the time has come to announce that we are going to be doing a seven hour live stream this weekend, starting Saturday around noon EST. I say around because technical difficulties are a thing. Not only is this my birthday live stream, but on top of that, it is also the first stage in a planned three secret projects. And to fulfill the first of those three secret projects, I need to do a whole lot of signing. And the challenge to me is to sign more things in one live stream than Brandon Sanderson ever has. That's right, I know I don't have as many secret projects as he does, but I can put my name on more stuff. I'll be having my friends come in and out, other YouTubers you all know and love, as well as my publisher sitting down right there with me. Because he is also coming in today to help me film that special 
announcement video. So if you would like to solve the mystery of what my three secret projects are, tune on in tomorrow and see what exactly I'll be putting my wrist through hell for. Back to the news! Wanting to make this week of fantasy news extra special though, I went ahead and reached out to fan favorite field correspondent man carrying thing, aka Jake, to see how the weather in Middle Earth is today. I don't know why I put up with this shit, man. You're getting rides to Fantasy Worlds. It's not that bad. You don't even pay for my airfare. Bob's been, Bob, I said don't charge him, man. I swear, Jake, that was something that was supposed to be handled. But tell us, how is the weather in Middle Earth in your 3429 essay? I have a YouTube plaque for God's sake. Did anyone see that? And show you to get more views than me in the first hour. Anyway, now we shall move from fantasy to sci-fi news and of the live action TV show adaptation variety. Because the Dune Sisterhood co-showrunner and creator, Diane Admu, sorry if I screwed that up, John, stepped down as co-runner of the show over at HBO Max. Now we haven't been given too many details of why exactly this is happening. Of course, it kind of immediately puts up red flags for fans. Oh my God, why is one of the showrunners leaving? But she apparently has several other current commitments and is staying involved in a producer role. So it doesn't necessarily seem like this was a bad blood situation or anything major aside from possibly her just having a lot of commitments, being a bit too busy to take on the executive role, and now stepping down to let someone else who might be a little bit more free in their time to take the reins. That's the best case scenario, but it also seems to me the one that's most likely. Though, of course, worse things could be happening. Big budget projects always have some kind of drama going on. Dear God, I learned that lesson last couple of years. But for me personally, this doesn't put up too many red flags, and it's like far too early on to judge anything concretely for an adaptation like this, so I'll just be sitting and waiting and going, okay, that happened. <laughs> what is that, you green skin maniac? There's blue people news. And there is indeed, because it has officially been confirmed that the budget for Avatar, the way of the water, was between 350 to 400 million dollars. And I've immediately seen people comparing this to James Cameron's recent comments about how this has to be one of the highest grossing films of all time to make its budget back and saying like, that's BS, it's only 400 million. That's like considered small change in the day and age of mom which one, that's not entirely true, but two, a budget for a movie isn't necessarily reflective of how much the movie actually costs because that does not take marketing and things like that into account. A lot of people talk though, like a movie can't become financially successful after its theatrical run. That happens far more often than I think a lot of people realize. It's why you do end up getting sequels to movies that may not have been big hits in the theaters, but turned out to be at home or streaming successes. Don't get me wrong, theatrical run, very important for the success of a film, but it's not everything. Speaking of Hollywood shenanigans though, it seems we are also getting a Bambi inspired horror movie. It's gonna be terrible. And yes, next month we're also getting a Grinch inspired horror movie. And don't get me wrong, when it was like first coming out they were getting like poo, blood, and honey, I was like, oh, this is kind of a fun new trend. And then we got followed up with the Peter Pan one. I was like, that could be interesting. But now it's like Bambi, and the Grinch, I just, that's, it's too much. You're pushing it too far, too fast. And I get in Hollywood, there's a million different people trying to always copy each other's success and they don't necessarily pull away from the quality of one another. But it's just like, oh, we got this kind of funny schlocky splash with poo, blood and honey. But now just seeing all these things that were either in development already and just weren't getting as much momentum or are kind of like springing off off of that. It just feels like, oh, it's, it's annoying and old before it even arrived. And I know some of you wanted an update on the 1899 situation, but there really hasn't been an update since I pinned my comment on that video where the author says she'll be taking legal measures. And um, I'm personally of the opinion as someone who has consumed both her book and 1899, that if she tries to go to court with this, she will be laughed out of the room. That's just my opinion. I am no legal expert, but I haven't seen someone who's consumed both stories who agrees with her. And in two pieces of quick news just before we go live here, it seems that Disney's latest cinematic release, Strange World, is projected to lose around a hundred million dollars. One of the studio's biggest flops ever. And that's just kind of one surprising to see, but kind of not because I didn't see like any marketing for this movie. So it seems like they may have just abandoned the project before it even came out, kind of seeing 
what the future held. I'm not entirely sure, though many people are saying this is tied into Bob Iger's sudden reinstatement as the head of the company due to quite a bit of scandals that are going on that are not necessarily fantasy news related in terms of the reasons the current or former president was removed. But the accusations going around the finances of Disney Plus aside, it's been interesting seeing how much Disney has underperformed over the last few years, and I'm not surprised, honestly, in hindsight to see Bob Iger return. But in a bit of good news for a larger franchise, it seems CD Projekt Red is going to be doubling down on their multimedia approach for the worlds they create. And seeing a video game company say this makes complete sense to me, but I don't know if you all remember back when we were kids, very often if there was a blockbuster movie, it would get a video game, comic book, things along those lines. They would just usually be kind of bad. Not always, but very often. Though, in the modern day and age of so many people being aware of the multimedia approach and how much it can actually benefit your original piece of media to have a good video game or vice versa, a good video game to then having a follow-up good show or movie, I think we're going to start seeing that trend return. And if I had to guess, things like Cosmere are going to be planned out to be adapted from the beginning in a multimedia way, because in the future of entertainment, it would kind of be stupid not to, in my opinion. Because from what I've seen, more people are getting educated on different stories that work better for different mediums, but franchises as a whole can be can benefit from them promoting themselves through multiple adaptations in different media. But if I had to bet money, I'd say it's gonna become more common. But we are going to end this episode of Fantasy News by talking about a first-person shooter adaptation of Starship Troopers coming from the creators of the game Squad. And for very obvious reasons, when I first saw this article, I immediately thought of like the early 2000s AVP games for the PC. I spent so much time playing with my brother. You have near future space marines going up against a giant hive of creature. DLC idea, introduce a predator in this one. <laughs> what this game is actually geared to be is apparently a 12 person squad survival type game. We are also going to have a building mechanic involved, which is a bummer for me because I personally f***ing hate those in games. <laughs> Love an idea of a fortification versus like an outside force, but just don't make me build it. I don't think Starship Troopers is a bad choice, especially with the movie. There's quite a few scenes where I'd be like, yeah, I'd like to charge as a Marine into that battle. I feel no remorse killing bugs. But basically just tell me what sci-fi game you would love to see made and which studio you'd like to see make it. But I can see an argument for a lot of series like The Expanse, not necessarily something like Natham, that'd be kind of dry. What would you be shooting at, the priests? <laughs> this might be like a whole let's debate in the future. But for me, it came down to Murderbot or Red Rising. And I think my answer just kind of comes down to whichever studio is going to make it. Cause if it was like the studio behind The Last of Us, Murderbot for sure. But this has just been your latest episode of Fantasy News. Be sure to check out the live stream this Saturday. We'll be doing all kinds of signings for a special charity thing, as well as having a bunch more cool announcements of what's in the future on the channel. I got books, I got merch. I'm gonna have more books soon. Have a good one, y'all. Peace.